to the international instruments that speak, and I need to do this because it's important, to the preservation and the right to enhance an individual's human rights. The International Convention on Civil and Political Rights, which has been ratified and which then, of course, becomes part of our law under Article 2, Sub Article 5 and 6, says this, and it's important that I read it out because you need to know that. It starts by saying, every human being has the right to life. And I stop there and I tell myself as a quote, Every human being has a right to life, that every human being includes the victim and the offender. It then says this. This right shall be protected by law. No one shall be arbitrarily deprived of his life. Most of the time when we read these provisions, we speak to them as they relate to the offender. My understanding is they relate to both the offender and the victim. That convention says as follows. That in countries that have not abolished the death penalty, death a sentence of death may be imposed only for the most serious crimes in accordance with the law in force at the time of the commission of the crime. So these international instruments that speak to human rights do recognize that there are exceptional circumstances when the death sentence may be inevitable. Let's look at Article 4 of the Africa Chat on human rights, on human and people's rights, ratified on 23rd of January 1992. It provides that human beings are invaluable. Every human being shall be entitled to respect for his life. His, in my considered opinion, includes her life. And the integrity of his or her person. Again, it reiterates no one may be arbitrarily deprived of this right. Muratetu reflected again. The Supreme Court says that you can indeed impose a death sentence for most serious offenses. Extremely grave. So the question is, is this a case of serious crime? In answering that question, I considered the following. What the evidence said The first thing that was revealed by the evidence is the manner in which the offense was committed. I want to remind ourselves of the judgment I delivered on 9th of February, where I indicated clearly that the evidence of the doctor who conducted the post-mortem report indicated that the person who perpetrated this offense cut the throat of the deceased through and through. In that judgment, I spoke to an understanding that the person was not an amateur. The person must have had some training. And remember the evidence even revealed that after the offense was committed, the deceased was put in the bathtub and the shower 
um, 